All right. Welcome to yet another episode of Tetra Tech Talks. My name is Eitan Suez, and I'd like to welcome you to today's episode. Today is Friday, June the 10th. Uh, the Tetrate Tech Talks are a weekly live stream where we feature a conversation with a guest and discuss technology. We do technical demos and more. Uh, Tetrate is uh, the enterprise service mesh company, and much of our focus is on uh, service meshes. And that means uh, we talk about Istio, Envoy, Kubernetes, uh, but we definitely don't shy away from talking about other topics and going further afield. Uh, what I'd like to do is... Um, just give you a sneak uh, preview here of our landing page. If you're new, if you've uh, never been on a Tetrate Tech Talk, I'd like to welcome you and invite you to say hello in the comments and uh, maybe where you're tuning in from. Uh, the URL to our landing page is uh, displayed uh, here on the, um, the bottom of the screen. You see that uh, Tetrate Labs at github.io, it's just a GitHub pages uh, landing page. And um, I'm going to make my font size a little bit bigger, and we're going to delve into our episode. So uh, we're talking about episode 10, um, which is a discussion on um, web application firewalls. But as usual, I like to uh, sort of give a, uh, a quick preamble um, before we introduce our guest, uh, Jose Carlos Chavez, who is with us today. Uh, so uh, the, the Tech Talks run weekly, every Friday, from uh, usually at 9 a.m. Pacific, uh, 11 a.m. Central, uh, noon Eastern, depending on where you are in the world, uh, good morning or good evening. Um, the objectives of the Tech Talks is to learn and share knowledge, and hence, uh, you know, uh, the, the topics that we discussed. You could see on our landing page, on the front page, uh, there's a list of uh, the episodes uh, that we... Um, that we've uh, covered in the past. Let me go ahead and sort of uh, peruse through those. So we've got about 10 episodes that we've done so far, and today is episode 10, of course. And uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Eitan Suez. I am your host, and our goal is to discover new tech and to have a great deal of fun in the process. Uh, just a quick recap of some of our previous um, tech talks uh, last week. We I had a special episode dedicated to discussing uh, the Istio certification exam by Tetrate. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's called the CIAT, uh, Certified Istio Administrator by Tetrate. And the week before, we did a technical demonstration of a deployment model for Istio that spans multiple clusters. So if you, if you didn't catch that one, uh, you can just hop on this link here and go to our YouTube playlist and, and watch those past episodes. But without further ado, and I've been keeping him waiting, uh, with me is uh, Jose Carlos Chavez. And this episode is, is kind of special uh, in my mind because it's the first in a series that I'm going to title Tetrand Profile. So us uh, Tetrate employees, uh, we call ourselves Tetrands. And, um, and the idea is to expose the work that we do, that our engineers do, uh, what they're working on, and that gives you a little bit of an idea of... Uh, of some of the things that are going on, some of the things that are cooking behind the scenes. Uh, cooking, I guess, I suspect is going to be one of our themes today. Um, so, uh, Jose, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'd like to quickly uh, introduce you to our audience. You are an engineer at Tetrate. You work on web application firewalls, which will be uh, the subject of our conversation. And you're also a core member of the Zipkin team. Uh, Zipkin, which is a distributed tracing uh, solution that many of us are familiar with in, in the world of distributed applications. So, so welcome on the show. Uh, really happy to have you. And thank you for volunteering to come and talk to us here. Um, and for those of you who are out there watching, uh, feel free to say hello to Jose. Jose, I'd like to give you um, the floor and maybe begin by letting you introduce yourself properly to, to our audience. Hi, everyone. Thanks for, for joining us today. Um, as, as Ivan said, I, I am a Tetran. I am also part of the Zipkit team. I, I have been working with uh, distributed systems for a while, like uh, around eight years or something like that, can't remember. Um, and uh, right now I'm working at the trade mainly with a web application firewall, which is 
um, a great suit uh, in the mesh world nowadays. And you know, and lately security has been a a, a big concern in in software engineering, and that's what uh, the trade is also focused on. Um, so yeah, I, I I mainly come from. I started in the PHP world, then I moved into Golem. Um, in the time of microservices, like uh, five years ago or something. Nice. Um, and now I'm working on web application firewall over WebAssembly, which is also a really nice piece of technology that is arising. So yeah, I'm happy to be here. Very nice. Welcome, welcome. So I, I really think the place to start in terms of the conversation, I, you know, not long ago, I didn't know very much myself about web application firewalls, and I suspect many of in our audience might be in a similar situation. Um, can you give us uh, maybe a basic introduction, sort of a web application firewall 101, as it were, uh, or to the topic? What is this all about? Okay, so uh, web application firewall is not something new, by the way. It's something that has been there for a while, but uh, in a different context, right? In, in, in the context of uh, websites, of course, because uh, the the attacks to, to websites and to web servers is as, as old as web servers themselves, as, as web itself. Um, web application firewall specifically is a, is a layer seven uh, defense protocol. Um, and uh, it's it's not necessarily designed to protect us from from every single attack out there, but it's, it's it covers uh, usually a good um, set of, of attacks that are known. Mm. It's usually part of uh, attack mitigation strategies, um, uh, but it's not only um, meant to to do mitigation. You can also do blocking filtering alerting so so yeah it, it basically consists on, on the or the idea behind web application firewalls is uh, basically to have a firewall in front of our application and then that uh, web application firewall uh, trying to f recognize a specific request uh, payloads and determine whether is this an attack or not is this something i should block or is this something right. i should alert the users about yeah, yeah it's and mainly it, and a, it's... a protection and and you mentioned layer seven. That's really the focus of this particular technology. Uh, when when did this technology come to into existence, so to speak? What's a little bit of the history of it? Uh, right. So uh, it started mainly around the nineties when, when web attacks. Well, when web became kind of popular, and web attacks, of course, became popular. Right. The the first implementation was focused on um, e-commerce websites uh, because of the transactions. You know. Um, that is where the first implementation started. Okay. Um, so I assume uh, organizations that use web application firewalls, how do they typically consume it? Uh, I guess they put it on their on their reverse proxy or something of that sort. Uh, they yeah, install they... some kind of extension. Or... Well. Uh... Typically, it's been used as a, as part of the reverse proxy, right? Um, they they usually put this uh, module of what it can be an extension or or it can be built in in the, in the proxy um, to filter uh, requests, right? To to also to monitor to basically process the the information in the request and and determine what kind of request is this a malicious request or not, and also to block, right? Blocking is also an important part of web application firewalls. Um, in my experience, it, it's still a, a, it has a great potential if you combine, for example, web application firewalls with machine learning. Because although you cannot block requests because you're not sure whether they are malicious or not, you can process the data after the, in a post facto way. So with machine learning, you can kind of learn where wow. these attacks come from and maybe. Come, come after with a with a new rule or a new strategy. I see. I see something that's adaptive. That's that's very interesting. I like that very yeah. much. Okay, uh, so I'm really interested in in delving into the, the specifics. I had myself to do a little bit of homework to learn a little bit about the landscape. And the thing that kept coming up is this this uh, tooling called Mod Security. Uh, what can you tell us a little bit about Mod Security? What is it? Uh, uh, is that the principal uh, sort of uh, mechanism that people, uh, in terms of consuming the technology, uh, do they primarily use that? 
Okay, so so mod security is so there are two things here um, that are kind of uh, a standard, uh, the de facto standard. There is uh, the core rule set, which is a set of rules that describe uh, well-known attacks or, or or some attack vectors out there in the industry, and that's that's uh, that's called core rule set. It's maintained by an organization called OWASP, and then there is modsec. Mod security is basically a, a module that started being part of uh, Apache HTTP server, um, which was supposed to interpret uh, or to um, let's say run these these rules um, that are written in seclang security language, um, and, and was the first engine to to be able to understand these rules and then process the request and, and accordingly filter, block, or, or alert. Based on that, um, it, it's uh, it's written in C plus uh, plus main. Well, it's it's written in C plus plus. As I said, it was part of the uh, Apache uh, web server. But in two thousand and fifteen, it became an own library because it, uh, there was an intention of using the mod security outside of the scope of Apache. So there has been like uh, different rewrites of the library. Uh, and, and in version two, it was a big rewrite, and then it started this opportunity to have live mod security, uh, which you could consume in other uh, proxies, like nginx yeah. or traffic. Yeah, I remember the day. I guess for for a project that's old enough, you know, initially there was Apache out there, and the way that you introduced something is as an Apache module, but it's probably had to evolve over the years, and now it's kind of a a library that can consume be consumed in multiple different ways. Okay. Yeah, exactly. All right. Uh, let me see here. Um, so the, the basic process then uh, is you pick essentially what, what uh, the connector, I guess there's some kind of connector for your web server and you install mod security. And then I guess there's a layer on top of that. Once mod security is installed, it's configured and I'm just sort of regurgitating what you were telling me through this uh, there's a language, right? And uh, where you define rules, but you don't have to build all these rules yourself in that OWASP, this organization has already been sort of curating a whole long list of very complete set of rules called the core rule set, which you typically want to start with, I suppose, uh, to protect yourself against. So what, what kind of what kind of things is it protects you against? Let's, that's, that's not a bad next question. Okay. Um... <laughs> Or originally, it protects you from SQL injection attempts, right? Because it, it can basically read the, the query parameters or the headers or, or the body payload um, and determine whether is this malicious or not. Or at least is this intended to be malicious? Because there are also some complexity around how the website is built for something to become an actual ad, um, attack vector, right? But this is like a, a set of rules, created set of rules with most common attacks, right? Like uh, cross-site uh, cross um, injection. Yeah, scripting. Um, yeah. yeah, so cross-site scripting, SQL injection. Um, you could also have like, for example, um, things that happen with the log for shell. It's, it's something that, uh, that can be prevented by mod security, basically because you, first can filter uh, the traffic. Um, also remote code injection and, right. and file okay. disclosure, right? Those are the things you can be protected by mod security and in general WAP uh, features. Okay, so I think that's, that's a pretty good summary of sort of the, the purpose of the project, what it does, it's pretty straightforward. If you're, you know, if you've got some kind of uh, exposure out there to the internet, you probably want to leverage this technology to protect yourself at, at that layer to prevent these sort of attacks. So fast forward to today, uh, what's, I'm kind of curious to learn what's, what's new, what's changed. It seems like every time you move from, uh, you know, we talk about monolith to microservices, the world of distributed applications, something breaks something needs to be retrofitted to adapt to this new reality. And uh, I suppose what I want to talk about is how does this apply to this particular technology? And I think you have, you might have some, uh, some illustrations you want to share with us. Uh, yeah, so let me, let me share these. Um, okay, so yeah, 
basically, uh, back in the days when we had when everything was a monolith, right? And you had a single application, and then uh, you basically put a WAF or or, a, or you have a proxy, and then you can embed what functionality in that proxy. And then the attacker, seen from the outside, is being um, filtered or blocked by the WAF functionality, right? That's in a traditional world because everything was working all together in this in, internally in the app. So basically, uh, you just needed to protect the whole. When we move to distributed architecture, the, the story is different, right? Because basically, you are as safe as uh, the the like the the weakest um, piece in your code in terms of security or the weakest uh, component. So in, in this in, in the distributed uh, days, uh, you not only receive requests from the outside, right? It's not like we and them. It's more like okay, I am an entity, I am a component, and I am receiving requests from different other pieces. They can be from the outside, they can be from the inside. In uh, from from the component standpoint, it doesn't matter where they, the 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 requests come from. So it can be or it cannot be malicious. It can be that the internal component is compromised and it's already doing a malicious request to, to my component. So there is a need for 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 everyone to be protected, right? To to separate this concern. Yeah. It's not like we all together get protected by what? It's more like I protect myself and then I I expect the others to protect themselves as well. That's why it's uh, the 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 single point of entry is not anymore. Um, ideal, right? Because it, it could have it, 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 microservices is not necessarily all about code. It's more about culture. Every team is independent. Every team has a own ownership uh, in the components. They can build uh, the systems in the way they want. And you don't necessarily, from from security standpoint, you don't necessarily want to trust them, right? That's why you need your own security uh, rules. I remember. And, and sorry, I'm getting so long in this answer. I remember back in the days we were discussing when we were moving to, to towards microservices. Um, yeah. We were discussing about okay, if I receive this request from from asking me for these images, um, should I trust that it comes from the, an internal service, or if it comes, from, if I know that it comes from an internal service, should I, should I just trust and this request, or should I? And put an authentication layer on in front of it, and yeah, of course, adding these uh, checks is an overhead, but in the end, it's worth right because you you are protecting the integrity of your data. So yeah, that, that's why yeah. we, we are in a new pattern of of uh, security in terms of web application firewall. Yeah, 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 and uh, this is really, I think, starting to trigger the light bulbs in my head. You know, because I I know I've. I've talked about Istio a lot before, and we, you know, a lot of us here are really interested by service mesh technology. And we know that uh, one of the biggest components of service mesh is workload identity, security, zero trust. So maybe we can uh, very quickly, uh, to for this again, for the sake of everyone listening, uh, can we get a, a quick summary of what what does zero trust basically mean? Yeah, zero trust is basically a new pattern in in, in the distributed. Uh architectures war where you don't want to trust anyone basically you you want to be self-protected um you don't know you basically don't don't trust that any request because you don't know where it comes from and and, and you don't know what they could be trying to do because uh, basically as i said in in a distributed environment people or teams can decide to do whatever they want so you don't want to rely on them to be secure for you to be secure you want to be secure by yourself so basically you you don't want to trust any uh, first you don't you don't trust by uh, just because we are in the same network you don't trust that anymore you um, you request them to have a certificate uh, from a known authority to say okay i am this service and then now i can trust you we can establish a connection um, yeah. you also don't don't want to trust them to access to every single uh, or or to any um, resource in your in your storage you basically request them Okay, do you have permissions to access to this piece of uh, information? 
um, although you are in the same network, although you're probably the, the user is already authenticated and you're passing a valid token, do you have the permissions to do this? This is all about zero trust. Do not to trust anyone, and, and to basically do you run your own checks and make sure that your data is only accessed when it's meant to be. Yeah. Um, so I mean, to me, this is starting to make sense. I, I suppose in the industry overall, where sort of in a state of flux, right? We're moving from the picture on the left to the picture on the right, and there's all of these concerns, right? One of them obviously is security, and one component of security then is is, is being protected at, at layer seven through web application firewall. So I, I could see this sort of migration that you've got to have a web application firewall around each microservice, which yet puts another burden on each of the development teams. Uh, I, I think I uh, sometimes we use the term cross-functional uh, responsibilities or non-functional uh, concerns that are uh, creeping up. Uh, that is, the, there's the business logic itself the team depends on. And, and then all of the other things which are requirements that you have to do, which are like these cross-cutting concerns. And I think I've harped many times before on how service mesh brings back some sanity into this. So, so if I look at the... Um, Enterprise landscape, I suppose, is there, and I don't know if this is something you can answer, but is there some kind of consensus out there in the industry that that is the, the new reality, that you really uh, need to have uh, security applied, uh, not just around the perimeter, but everywhere else? Uh, and, uh, and what, I suppose, uh, how, how do we actually realize the picture on the right? Uh, yeah, I guess in the context of service mesh, I can see a way, right? Yeah, I think the, 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 the thing is that it's not as easy as it looks like, right? Because in the context of uh, Kubernetes and service mesh, of course, um, you abstract all this complexity uh, from the application and basically you keep that in the, in the, like the, the mesh level, right? You, add, you deploy this, um, for example, this, this WAF plugin, and it's the, the complexity is totally abstracted from your application logic. So in that sense, that that becomes easier, at least, uh, not necessarily less yeah. laborious, but easier. But if you are not there, then it can be messy because uh, then you will probably try to uh, introduce this WAF in or, or mix with your application and code. And then that's right. uh, that's not easy. But I think... If it was as easy as deploy uh, an extension in in the in your sidecar, you, talking about the mesh, uh, yeah, in so mesh case, then then everyone will buy in because uh, this is definitely a, a potential, or, or it has a lot of attack vectors that, that uh, are there while not having a, a web application firewall that you want to avoid. Okay, so the idea is basically. Uh, if you have a service mesh, you have Istio, which means you have Envoy in your data plane and it's, it's the sidecar is there. And so we can begin to imagine maybe, okay, instead of uh, you know uh, an Apache module that ingress, now you're applying, somehow applying mod security to Envoy. Is there is there a connector for Envoy? How would that work uh, exactly? I'm kind of curious. <clears throat> so the, the way to extend Envoy functionality is through WebAssembly um, filters, right? Um, there are definitely not, that's not the only one way and, and certainly it's not the easiest way to, to introduce mod security um, in Envoy um, because you could also choose to compile your own Envoy every time and, and introduce mod security there because you have the control of the, of the compilation and that will make everything uh, much more like I wouldn't say easy because that brings another set of problems. But okay, in 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 the mesh world, the way to extend Envoy is uh, create a web assembly application, web web assembly filter um, that has different um, problems uh, because you have to compile uh, mod security, for example. You have to compile it statically. You cannot access to to file system, so you probably need to load the the rules uh, in memory, and there are, uh, okay. uh, there, there are a variety of problems there. Um, whereas if you choose, for example, okay, I, I don't want to deal with the web assembly because it's complex to compile on, uh, mod security there. I want to introduce um, mod security inside Envoy and compile myself. 
okay, that good luck with that. I mean, you can do it, but then maintaining that, compiling your own Envoy every single time is going to be a nightmare. So yeah. that's that's uh, you you should find a perfect balance on that. Um, that's what we're working on right now. Um, basically, trying to to get the mod security into a WebAssembly filter, but the, as I said, it, it has a a big set of problems that we are trying to tackle. Um, the idea is that by the end of the year, we we can get something functional at least with a core rule set. Okay. Yeah. Um, so so yeah, that's exciting. Uh, for for the benefit of our audience, I know a few weeks ago we had Brian Sletten on uh, talk about WebAssembly. So if you missed that episode and you want to know the the foundation of WebAssembly, uh, that's really the place to start. And uh, I think there's another piece to it, which, uh, and I'll, I'll bring it up later. Uh, we, we run a free workshop, uh, I think monthly on, on uh, how to employ WebAssembly specifically for, uh, for, for proxies such as Envoy with a specific, I think, uh, library, the, the proxy was an SDK, I think is what it's called. Uh, maybe yeah. we can spend a minute to, to just give a brief introduction to what that's all about. Yeah, so, so basically um, there was this initiative to have a standard way of, uh, of build filters for WebAssembly in the proxy context, not necessarily only for Envoy. Envoy is, of course, the, the leading case, uh, but that wasn't designed. It was also uh, meant to be supported in Kong, for example. So um, the, that... Uh, there is a concept called ABI, uh, which is uh, application binary interface, which is basically like an API, but uh, for binaries, it describes what a binary should be able to 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 do and to run. Um, and proxy wasm um, SDK is uh, is uh, is meant to be a wasm um, compiled um, binary, but also has some um, let's say restrictions about what you can do. But also has some restrictions about what you're supposed to do because it's only designed, it's only meant for proxy, right? Um, the idea behind a, the, the the WebAssembly filters is that they run in a, in isolation in a virtual machine with no access to this, so you don't compromise um, the main process. Um, it, it, so it's way more complex uh, in terms of uh, how to build it than building for WebAssembly. That's why it's also uh, something we are trying to get uh, working. Uh, as I, yeah, uh, as you're showing, uh, there are uh, much more restrictions about what you can run um, because you it has limited access to the headers. It, uh, you have limited access to to the body to response headers um, to response body. Like it's you're basically programming in a very, very restricted environment uh, where you can only access to the data through certain methods. And then you should basically uh, do as much as you can with those specific methods. Yeah, yeah. So what I took the liberty of uh, to uh, to go ahead and put uh, up the GitHub page for the Proxy Wasm project, which has this illustration, which really helps understand. Yeah. I, and I, I find that kind of exciting. Uh, uh, kind of project, the idea, okay, you've got the C++ code base and uh, you need to compile it into a, uh, a WebAssembly binary that you can then use as a WASM filter. Uh, so you, you've been through that journey, right? How Can you relate a little bit of that journey to, to our audience, what it was like? And is it is it actually, do you have something working? Do you actually have, can you run Envoy, uh, you know, maybe with a funky CLI and... Uh, and, yeah, and show so, us a configuration, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so we we have um, we we basically managed to compile uh, a WebAssembly filter from Envoy. Um, we we base it. Uh, there are different efforts to do that. Um, we are not the first ones trying to do that. There are different efforts where people is uh, willing to do that by by restricting the capabilities of mod security. Um, but I can quickly show you what we have been doing. Um, there is this repository where we run, uh, it's called mod security wasm filter end to end. Um, this is based on the Intel. Uh, Intel um, not so long ago uh, started this 
Um, so that this mode security wasn't filtered where they are um, trying to basically tackle the same problem as us. And since this is open source, we are also uh, participating of this. Um, so basically in my in my end-to-end um, -end repository, which is uh, here, by the way. Oh, yeah. and, I, and I recognize this is an Envoy uh, configuration file, right? I see the static uh, resources yeah. uh, block there. So for those yeah, of you. Yeah. Yeah. So basically what I did was, um, I created an end-to-end -to, -end to run this to make sure that it works. It has a, a simple test case. Um, let me show you the config here. Basically, what we do is that we declare, um, this is an Envoy config, we declare a WASM filter. Um, the way to declare is basically through this. Um, the configuration is easy. Basically, you pass a set of uh, rules uh, in the seclang format, as I said. Uh, for example, here we are setting the debug log level. Where here we are setting the debug log file. Um, this is controversial because you are not able to to write uh, files in 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 the WebAssembly context. Um, but this is something something we are trying not not trying to do, but uh, we are trying to to tackle now. Not not to write files into the in, in the VM because they won't be accessible, but. Right. Where do we all put this, right? Then you can um, you can run the engine in three modes. It can be on, off, or um, um, monitor only. In in on, well, you're running the the, the filtering and the blocking. Um, in off, you don't run anything. And then in the monitor only, you are basically uh, running the engine not doing any blocking or, or filtering or anything. You're just dropping a log whenever you find something that is suspicious. And then here, what we are basically stating is that, okay, if the request contains the path admin, then we will deny. And that's, that's a very simple, um, that's a very simple, uh, let's say rule. Then you declare what is the file name you are running, right? Okay, so that's so that dot me... wasn't file is basically you you must have built that C plus plus project into that WebAssembly binary, and that's that's the exactly file. okay, okay, exactly. So for example, I'm gonna run this. Okay. So basically, what I'm gonna do here is that I will run Envoy using Funky. And, and using um, using uh, funky, uh, you can see everything in the readme. Right. We're gonna run Envoy with this configuration and log level info. But we are also setting a component level, which is wasm debug, so we can see what exactly is happening in wasm. Okay, Envoy is running. Um, you can see what are the configuration that we oh, yeah. uh, loaded here. And uh, then we will open another terminal here. And we are exactly calling, um, let me just check. Out. Curl, right, not CD. <laughs> oh. Yeah. We're calling admin, okay? Yeah. First, we're calling just plain uh, localhost a two eight zero zero one, and it's uh, you get a two hundred. For for the example, what we are seeing here is that we are adding something called X Wasm Custom, which is basically a header that we added um, through the Wasm extension. Right? If you see any of the tutorials of about uh, Wasm filters built for Envoy, you can see that this is something trivial to do um you can uh, you can redact headers add headers um drop headers you can do any sort of these things but okay this uh, request has been going through this um, extension of this filter sorry you can see um all that happened in the wasm logs um you can see here that we run on request headers. We were looking at the headers. Okay. Um, yeah, and I recognize those. Those are basically callbacks from the proxy wasm. Uh... Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, That's wonderful. 
so now this this request gave us 200 because it's it's it isn't supposed to be to be blocked but right. now we are going to try the the admin one because the admin one is supposed to be blocked through this rule right and now we get forbidden yeah. okay i see uh, nice. that's that's the whole idea let me just uh, take one second uh, because I wanted to show the core rule set. How does it look like? Because it it's 700 kilobytes of uh, rules. <laughs> so it, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's quite a lot, uh, quite a lot uh, set of files. And um, let me open this for you. For example, you can see here the rules. For example, let's check at this. Well, this is a this is basically these are rules for Drupal. Um, basically, you can see that the, the, the language is yeah. quite declarative. You basically specify, specify, for example, disable the CRS completely for all occurrence of password. Um, whenever you have passwords uh, and, and, and and you yeah. don't, you don't want to, to once your installation is in place, you don't want to anyone to access to the install um, the script again, right? Um, so yeah, you, you have different kind of rules. Um, for example, this one, um, it can get uh, somehow um, messy. Yeah, so I, that's I, why there is a curated set of rules. I quickly came to the realization once I started looking at the core rule set that it's a, a very uh, I don't know what's the word, a very well-loved project in that it's been curated. It's a set, I mean, it's first of all, the number of rules is staggering. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and through this language, you could see how the, the care that someone put into making sure that uh, all of these different threats are are mitigated. Uh, it's, it, yeah. it seems like a very, um, very detailed and uh, perhaps complex project. Yeah, and this is just a core rule set because you can define your own rules. That's in addition, where... yeah. In addition of them, yeah, the, and and most of people do. For example, security companies have their own set of rules that are private, of course. That, yeah. that, that they run basically on the on the disclosures. But this brings me to a topic. For example, if we talk about what happened with the lock for shell thing, um, yeah. there is a technique called virtual patching, um, which is something that you usually do with Mozek, for example. Um, where you can uh, basically patch your application um, by adding a Mozek rule um, to block requests with certain payload, right? Remember that lock for shell uh, was yeah, there was uh, a specific. There's a string yeah. like a Jindi something or other that had that you could maybe hook on to determine that it was a uh, an attack. Yeah, exactly. So so you can easily patch that with mod security rules. If you have a WAF deployed in your in your architecture and you have this rule for blocking, um, you can easily, you don't even need to understand what the vulnerability is, right? Where does it come from? You don't even need to know that it came from Log4j. As long as you know that when you receive this URL, you have to block it. Yeah. Yeah, that's wonderful. Which, which kind of leads me to, uh, so I, I took a peek at, at some of the, it's kind of interesting. I, I think we had a conversation previously about how uh, the rule set historically was something static, something you loaded, or not you, but uh, so the system loaded from the file system. But with WebAssembly, you can't really do that very easily. There's a security model in place. And one of the things I saw in the Intel project is this notion that the rule set can be fetched from a rule server. Uh, yeah, so so this is this is actually interesting because as I said, the core rule set is around 700 uh, kilobytes um, in files. And, and if you look at the manifest that you can declare for, for Kubernetes or, or for Istio, uh, there is one megabyte limit that which leaves only 300 kilobytes for the user to define their own rules. And as you see, they are like quite verbose. Um, so the, the, the rule server works for two things. First, um, for you to, because as I said, um, in the WASM um, VM, you cannot access files, right? 
Um, what happens in other uh, deployments of mod security is that you tell mod security, okay, this is the location where you're going to find all the rules, and then you access directly to this, and then load them. But that, that's not possible in Wasm. So you either keep them in memory when, when, when running the, the Wasm filter, or either you use something like the rule server, because although Wasm cannot access to the file system, it can access to clusters in the Envoy way, right? I clusters see. from in, in the Envoy concept. Um, and then if you can access to the rule server, you can pull all the rules and then um, run accordingly. So that's that's why rule server is, is useful for this. Um, it's all, it can be also useful for um, like change the, the, the mod security rules live nice that's what i was getting to that's that's really powerful yeah so you want to yeah. add a rule and you could do it live without taking anything down and patch your log for shell problem there and yeah, then exactly. yeah exactly so so that's that's all about uh, the, or, or that's the, the the solution for this complexity around was and filtered uh, the, the the rule server um this is something that we we are most likely implement as well. We we experimented with this as well, um, but as of now, our main goal is to support uh, from the beginning the entire core rule set. So that's what we are working on. Okay, so if if I were to extrapolate then everything we've learned, the you basically once the hardest piece seems to be. Uh, getting the core rule set to function as a WebAssembly extension and Envoy. But once you have that in place, uh, making that propagated to all of the sidecars you want in your mesh through some kind of selector with, I know that in Istio there's the Wasm plugin uh, CRD, you're pretty mm -hmm. much, you're there. You're able to apply this sort of security en masse to all your microservices. And then the promise is that all of the burden on the developers goes away again. And they're the same sort of promises that Istio makes vis-a-vis -vis other things like observability or workload identity. It becomes just another one of those things you get for free in your mesh. And that sounds like a really powerful thing. Yeah. And also you can you, you basically do that in a company-wide policy, right? You don't need to, to get users to... Um, to to actually implement this, the, it will just get deployed inside the namespace. Okay. Now I know. Uh, okay, so Tetrate is obviously it has its own enterprise product, the Tetrate Service Bridge, where I know we mm -hmm. have some WAF yeah. capabilities already in our product, and then we are probably also have a roadmap, I suppose, to to continue adding more of such capabilities. Uh, is is some of that also going to trickle down to open source to? Uh, I suppose this, you, all of this work you just showed us are, are open source repositories that you're actually out there contributing to the, directly to those open source projects. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. So basically, Tetrade is a, like an, it's, there is an, a strong culture of open source. So um, everything we do, of course, we, uh, I come, you know, I come from, from Sepkim. So um, I, 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 I learned some lessons about how to, to build open source from a corporate or, or from a company, from within the company. And yeah. so you usually first um, like uh, brew the solutions internally, you make them mature and then you, you contribute back to the community. That's the way we do. We, we basically de develop a, a solution, try to land it. And once it's proven to work and then we can go back to the community and say, okay, this is what we are going to, what, what we are doing and, and, and you can also do it. So, so yeah, we most likely are continue working um, elbow to elbow with the uh, Intel and, and also with the, with the ModSec community, which is most likely taking over also the Wasm, um, the, the, the Wasm filter. And there is a pull request already. There is a, like a, an agreement that, this is becoming a first class concern so yeah we but as you can see we we in in in, in the concept of uh, developing this WAF functionality we have contributed to very different projects like the intel mod security wasn't filter like tiny go corasa um yeah proxy wasn't so yeah uh, we, we we have a strong culture of doing that yeah it, it really is amazing 
uh, I, I forget now, but uh, the percentage, if you, I think I've seen these pie charts that show the percentage of contribution to some of these major open source projects and Tetrate being such a small company seems to have uh, more than its fair share of uh, open source contributions, which is terrific. Yeah, so, exactly. Uh, one thing I took the liberty to do, uh, JC, is to compile some links. Now, I'm going to get together with you afterwards, and maybe we can uh, curate that a little bit more. But for those of you who are interested and you want to go deeper, uh, I went ahead and put a link to the, the Wikipedia page on mod security. If you want to read more about the, the core rule set from the OWASP organization, uh, it's really amazing how well documented this, this rule, core rule set is. Uh, if you want to learn about the mod security wasn't filter, that's that Intel uh, open source project, uh, the link is there. Uh, and then uh, your end-to-end -end tests, I, I also linked from there. And there's a few blog entries that specifically talk about uh, using WAF to detect a log for J exploit or, or what WAF features are available in, in our product TS, uh, TSB, the Tetrate Service Bridge. So all those links are there for our audience to, to explore and, uh, and sort of gain a deeper understanding of this subject. I think it's, it's fascinating. And I, I guess I want to say um, to our audience, uh, it's my reflection on, on this conversation is the realization of the, the sheer size of the, uh, of the work uh, that, uh, you know, you're in a service mesh space, but there's so many different facets, so many different concerns. This is layer seven security through web application firewalls applied in the sidecar. And that's just one of many, many different things that we have to sort of take care of in producing sort of a, a, uh, an enterprise grade solution out there for, for folks to consume. Uh, now, JC, I, uh, I can't let you go without asking you some personal questions. Uh, sure, go ahead. That's something we just didn't do. I, I, you know, these are tech talks after all. We're supposed to talk about tech, but uh, first of all, if I'm not mistaken, you're coming to us live from Barcelona. Is that right? Is that your home base? Yeah, I live in Barcelona. I am originally from Peru. I actually promised uh, in my Twitter that we were also talking about Peruvian food in, in, in this talk, but probably in, in the second part. Um, yeah, I'm from Peru. I, I moved to, to Europe in 2014. Uh, and by the end of 2015, I moved to Barcelona, where, okay. where I'm um, based. And, and I love it, actually. Wow. Okay, so what can, if there's one thing, one takeaway about Peruvian food, what, what do you want to share with, with our audience? That sounds really interesting. I know nothing about Peruvian food, but it sounds... I'm, Just I, try it. Just try <laughs> it, but ask a Peruvian to, to recommend a, a place, um, because of course there is also good and bad places, but ask a Peruvian or go to a place where you see Peruvians having food. I see. That's, that's a good way to go, but yeah, just try it. Just try it. Okay. You must try it. That's a recommendation we, we, I will so, heartily so we, take. We have like uh, several kind of uh, dishes from several regions with different, um, let's say, di different ingredients from different regions. Like it's 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 really good, and and, and you gotta try it. Okay, will do. I will seek a Peruvian restaurant in my neighborhood, and and I'll, I'll get back with you and let you know uh, what I discovered. Uh, that's that's terrific. Um, and I, for, for our audience, just want to let you know real quick um, that uh, that's the way Tetrate rolls. We've got employees all over the world. We're distributed across almost all time zones, I want to say. And uh, we're going to continue to do these Tetrate profiles and expose the work of other Tetrate engineers. I think uh, we have uh, one of our field engineers will come on uh, in early July and talk to, to us about their work as well. Now, there's a question. Uh, let's see. Uh, so Jai is asking, can you paste the link here, please? So uh, Jai, I want to let you know that uh, on the Tetrate Tech Talks website, uh, you will find the landing page for this episode, which has all of the links, not just that one. So, uh, so the one link that, that rules them all, so to speak, is the one that I'm showing right now. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, and go ahead and, and give you that link also in the comments since I'm already there. Uh, so thank you for asking, and uh, hopefully that will guide you to uh, to the right place. 
Uh, okay, well, uh, JC, that brings us to the, the end of our episode. I do have a few sort of uh, closing matters. Uh, you're free to, to hang on, uh, and uh, maybe we can talk through these together before we, we sort of uh, finish our episode. So I, I want to give to our audience uh, just some uh, heads up in terms of events that are coming up. Uh, Tetrate has got a bunch of events lined up for the month of June. You go to the Tetrate events web site which looks something like this and you'll see that we're running a couple of free workshops so if you want if you're new to Istio we have a 0 to 60 workshop June 14th we have a web assembly extensions workshop which is very relevant to our conversation today on the 15th uh, we also have a conversation on Envoy Gateway with Matt Klein, uh, the creator of Envoy, and uh, Damian Hansen, who's an, uh, also a Tetrate engineer on the project and then uh, next week uh, we are going to I'm going to be uh, having the privilege to interview Kelsey Hightower, and we're going to talk service okay. niche. Is yeah. he doing a live demo? Uh, that's a good question. I'm going to uh, ask him. We uh, we have a conversation lined up, uh, but maybe uh, we can hold his feet to the fire. Is there something yeah. specific you want me to, to relate well, to? Well, he, he's very famous because uh, for his uh, live demos. Uh, though okay. I read on Twitter, he, he was uh, thinking of uh, stopping doing that, but uh, it will be cool. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, Detroit also has these uh, essential courses, right? These two essential, Envoy Essential. I took yes. them as part of the onboarding. I joined at Detroit like in, in, in mid-January. Okay. I didn't know anything about Istio or Envoy. I took the courses. I learned many things. So, yeah, nice. worth it. Okay, so you, there you have it. This is like, a, what do we call it? The first-hand um, testimony, so to speak, yeah, that yeah. our academy is worth visiting. So uh, the Tetrade Academy, where we have the Istio Fundamentals and Envoy Fundamentals courses, they're free, of course, and, uh, and our certification exam, which I would be remiss not to uh, also mention. And that, uh, the last item of, uh, of, of business, so to speak, is uh, where you can find us if you want to reach out and ask a question, propose a subject for a future episode, which we just had someone this morning do, which was wonderful. Someone asked uh, by the name of Machi. Uh, he said, you know, you guys should really talk about how to... Uh, you, you can talk about Istio, but you can do Istio by, by doing it from the inside. Check out the code. Show us how to check out the code and build the code base and, and, and review the unit tests. And so that, that's, I think, a great idea. And I'm going to try to figure out uh, uh, maybe a, a future episode, maybe in July, where we can slot in that one of our engineers can give us a demo of how to build Istio mm -hmm. and how to, to go through the unit tests and, and learn it from the inside. So that's another idea that... Uh, you can likewise contribute by joining our Slack channel, the Tetrate Community Slack, and the invite URL is there at the bottom of that page. All right. Well, JC, yeah, cool. uh, any any parting words for for our audience? Well, well, thank everyone for for being here. I am so excited about this. I I really enjoy my work at the trade with uh, Waf and Wasm. Um, I think uh, the trade is, is not only great by the, the things that we deliver, but also because of the process of building things where we properly iterate, design, discuss, learn, and improve our, our, our things. Um, and yeah, so come by, um, ask questions. I'm on Twitter by J-C-C-H-A-V-E-Z-S. I'm I'm gonna drop it here in case you wanna <laughs> ask some questions about WAF, WebAssembly, um, Sipkin, observability, whatever. That's and thanks Ethan for, for inviting me. Of course. Thank you for coming on. That's much appreciated. All right, guys, we're gonna close this episode. Thank you for tuning in and uh, we'll see you next week in our in our next episode. Bye. Bye bye.